the church in our, in our launch team, our launch phase, we, we started uh, doing a couple of core teachings. And one of those core teachings uh, was this Thanks and Giving series. And, and if you've been at Radiant Church for a while, like you know that every year we kind of do a legacy series in the fall. And, and we talk about the importance of leaving a, a, a legacy. And uh, this kind of was the forerunner uh, to that. And, and this, this teaching series is, is core, I think, to who we are as a church and, and who we'll become and where God will take us down the road. But I think also, uh, the, the teaching from this series is, is a core DNA component for any Christ follower. This is going to be a really important series that we do here uh, in the coming weeks. We're going to talk a lot about the importance of aligning your life uh, with Jesus and getting your life together with Christ uh, at, at the center. And it's not quite as teach-heavy. I, I tend to be more teach-heavy in how I do things. That's me and how I roll. Uh, this is not going to be quite as teach-heavy of a series, but it's going to be pretty practical. But nevertheless, it's going to be uh, highly important for us. And I, I want you to understand the importance of aligning your life around this idea of living in a state of thanks and giving. Thanks and giving. Of gratitude and generosity. Uh, thanks and giving is very biblical. It, it, is, it is a biblical stance for us to take to be, uh, to be thankful to God and have gratitude for what He's done for us and then also be generous and give back and, and practice that spirit of generosity the Lord puts inside of every one of His followers. Man, that's very important. And it seems so natural this time of year to do that. I don't know if you've noticed, we're, we're in the throes of Christmas giving right now, man. I that's what we're at. We, 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 we have Christmas in some places and Thanksgiving in others. We haven't quite started that yet. I don't know if your house is, is maybe you're the other person. You're like, Pastor, uh, I've already done that. I've already got the decorations up and the trees up and it's, it's there. And, and I, was, I was one of those folks years ago who was like, nah, man, give the turkey his day. Let it, let's have it. Let's, let's have Christmas afterwards. And then I, I, I did something and, and, and that, that kind of shifted all of that. So uh, I, I, we're part of a network called the Assemblies of God and, and and I'm in the leadership for our network in, in our state. And part of my job is I, I, I help talk through church planners and church revitalization guys. And, and, and normally they always ask a question. If you could go back and do things over again, what would you do? And, and, and they're looking for some kind of big, like, you know, systematic, you know, systemic kind of answer, some kind of like structure or whatever. And, and the thing that I tell them is if I could go back and do things all over again, I would not have moved my family the week before Christmas. <laughs> like, I don't know who came up with that idea. Uh, it was probably Shana because I have all the good ideas. My wife has all the, t you know, I'm kidding. Don't tell her that. She's, she's helping get some things ready this morning. She didn't hear that, okay? No, I, I, listen, I, I said, hey, let's come up and we'll, we'll move into the home and get things ready the week before. Won't, won't that be great? So we moved in the week before Christmas and, and there were boxes everywhere in our house and, and there were no lights and no festivities and we got the tree up. That was kind of neat, I guess, but it, it did not seem like Christmas and I felt like such a terrible husband and father and, and I told my guys, I said, man, you know what? Here's what I'll do. Uh, from this day forward, I will, I will shed, I'm very traditional around the holiday season, I, said, I will shed my tradition and on November 1st, you can decorate the tree and play Christmas music and, and we've, we've done that ever since and my kids love it and family loves it and so everyone's happy and, and so we're, we're part of that group uh, for sure that does that kind of thing but we're but it seems natural this time of year to do that right it seems natural to to be generous and and have gratitude as we kind of get into the holiday season but the, the the issue with that is it's not natural to live that way um typically year round like we it, it just seems like we kind of get in the spirit and it goes that way in november december but really we don't live that way typically a lot of us struggle to live in this idea of thanks and giving. And my hope over the next few weeks is you see how game-changing this idea can be of living in a, in, a, in a mindset of thanks and giving for your life. It can be massively game-changing for you and how you deal with people and how you live. And we're going to come face-to-face -face in a couple of weeks with some very uncomfortable kind of realities to that, um, for sure. We'll have some difficult conversations, I'm sure, in a couple of weeks uh, when we get to talk about a few things. But, but for, before we get there today, what I want to do is I want to tackle this idea about aligning your life correctly. Because in order for you to live with a mindset of thanks and giving, 
You have to make sure your priorities are straightened out. And you've got to make sure that your life is aligned the way that God has designed it for us. And so uh, what I've got up here to kind of help us with that is I've got some buckets. Now, I'm going to move these down a little bit more so you guys can see. I didn't tell these guys how to lay them out because I wasn't sure yet. But let me help you out a little bit. I want you to see what we got up here. we got all kinds of buckets up this way. Here's what I want you to do with these buckets. I want you to picture every one of these buckets as if they're kind of like compartments. Okay? So imagine these buckets, these different buckets that we have up here, are compartments for your life. Uh, a lot of us... Some more than others, we tend to compartmentalize everything. We have a space for all kinds of things in our lives. Some of you guys are obsessive over it, and some of you guys aren't. But to some extent, we compartmentalize everything. And we have this belief that, hey, we're in control. And, and, and we're in control, and we can make sure that because we're in control, we have a say in how we live our lives and what we do and what direction we go in and all that kind of stuff, you know? We're control freaks. We, we, we like to control all kinds of things. We want to make sure that, hey, I, you know, I, 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 I'm the guy who, whenever I go somewhere, I want to drive the car. I don't want to be the passenger. Because in my, my way of thinking is this. If we get into an accident, I'm not doing it because you weren't a good driver. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to do it because I was in control and I was driving. I'm getting behind the wheel. Uh, but we all tend to want to do that. But that's not scriptural, right? So scripture says we should not control everything. In fact, scripture teaches the opposite. Psalm 24, 1 says this. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all of its people belong to him. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all of its people belong to him. I, you know, one of the things that God expects from us is, is to be good managers, to be a good manager. And, 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 and that's a, there's an old school term for that. If you grew up in church, um, if you have a church background, the old school term for that is steward. Be a good steward of what God's given you. Now, I grew up in church and I would hear that term and it would drive me crazy because no one talks like that, <laughs> right? No one says, I'm going to be a good steward of my dogs or a good steward of my clothes or what no we say I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to handle that. That's what it means. You're managing and taking care of and handling things. And so, look, that's our role, to be good managers of what God has given us and to handle what the Lord has given to us. The problem is we don't readily recognize our role as managers or people who take care of things. In the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, God creates man from dust and he tells Adam, you take care of, you manage, handle the garden. That's his job. That's our job. What we run into is we think we are the owner, but we're not the owner. God is the owner. We're the manager. Psalm 24, 1 lays it out right here. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So everything belongs to God. He owns it all. We don't own anything. Think about that. Your job, your family, your finances, it all belongs to God. It doesn't belong to us. You don't get to take anything with you when you die. When you leave this world, nothing goes with you. And that's hard to accept for a lot of people because you put so much time and energy and resource into so many things, but they don't leave with you. My, my knowledge, my degree doesn't go with me. My assets don't go with me. My, I've got it. My, my favorite possession I have, because I'm a big baseball fanatic, is a signed autograph picture of Joe DiMaggio. Love that. Can't take it with me. Jolton Joe's going to stay behind. I can't take him with me when I leave this world. And so, you know, we can't focus so much on what we have here at the expense of what God has for us over there. You don't take it with you. When you open up your portfolio this week, you're not going to look at your IRA and say, man, God owns that. You know what you're going to do? You're going to look at the IRA and you're going to say, gosh, it's down today. What can I do to fix that? When you have a conflict with your spouse or your kids, you're not going to have this conflict and say, you know, how is God going to solve this issue? No, but you know, especially for the guys in the room, and that's what you're going to say. You're going to say, how about fix it? <laughs> how can I fix it? How can I make it right? How can I... Ha hey, so much is, is me, right? It's not natural. I said at the beginning, it's not natural for us to view everything as if God owns it all. But the truth is, God owns everything. 
We are just the caretakers of what God has given to us. And part of the reason why it's, it's, it's so natural for us to try to fix everything is also because we've compartmentalized so many areas of our lives. And this is not like an exhaustive list of compartments that I have up here, but we, we've compartmentalized so many different places. We, we naturally try to organize our lives into different compartments, or in this case, buckets. Some of you, very a few of you were here when we first gave this message series a few years ago, and this will be kind of a refresher for you, but for many of you, this will be brand new. And I'm telling you today, I'll say it again, if you can zone in for the next few weeks, uh, this will be game-changing for you. See, we have all kinds of compartments, all kinds of buckets. We have one right over here. This is, this is one that so many of us in the room have. We have our, our, our work bucket, right? This is work. I don't, I don't do a suitcase. I do a book bag. But, you know, like we, we have work. Our job that defines who we are, right? You know, think about it for how our, how our jobs work for a moment. You know, when you, when you go up to somebody and, and, and you talk to them and you meet them for the first time, what, what do you say? Hey, my name's Jim. Who are you? Well, I'm, I'm Tom. Oh, cool, Tom. Like, what do you do? Hey, oh, oh I'm, I'm a lab technician, okay? Oh, what do you do? Well, you know, I, I, I use CAD and I design automotive or whatever it is. What do we do? We almost, within the first five or ten minutes of meeting somebody new, we, we find out what they do because we look at their job and their role and we think, you are defined by whatever it is you do. And so what we do is we end up saying, man, I'm, I'm Sue and I'm a stay-at-home mom. I'm, I'm, I'm Matt and I'm a real estate agent. I'm, I'm Tina and I'm a teacher. And, and we identify and wrap up what we do with who we are. And there's a problem with that. There's a big problem with that. Because what you do is not who you are. You are so much more than that. And people struggle with stress and anxiety and meaning because they've put everything, we've conditioned folks to do this, they've put everything and wrapped it up in what they do. It's one of the reasons why some folks, when they retire, they really have a hard time with it. Like, what, what, how, how am I going to spend the rest of my days? I've been doing this job for 45 years. This is all I've known and who I, this is all I know to do. You're not supposed to wrap your identity around a job and what you do, but so many of us do. But we have a place for that. We got a compartment for our jobs and, and for what we do. We also have a compartment for something else, though, too. We have another one here for, for, like, for family, right? We have family. Got a picture of, of my kids in here. You can't see it all the way, but I got a picture of my family right here, man. Hey, we, we love our family, don't we? Family is important. Family is fantastic. There's a place for our family in our lives, too. It's got its own little space, its own little place where it goes in. And our families are all different. They all look, to they're not all the same. Some of you guys, man, you got like seven kids. Like you got eight kids, six kids. I don't know, you got a lot of kids, man. Some families are small. I, I coached my son's fall ball team this year, and, and, and one of the players in the team, I thought he was the oldest kid. And so I asked his mom uh, one night after practice, I was like, hey, uh, you know, so how many, how many siblings uh, does, this, does this guy have? And, uh, and she goes, oh, well, well, you know, there, there's seven of them. And without missing a beat, not, I just, I'm not proud of this, okay? This is just, I'm just, I'm very, I am transparent with you as much as I can be to my own detriment, right? So without missing a beat, I looked at her and I said, why? <laughs> like, you have seven, why? Because uh, in my head, I'm like, man, three, three's, three's enough, and I'm good. And some of y'all can handle more. I know, I told you it was terrible, it was not good. I'm not proud of that as your pastor. Uh, she thought it was hilarious and had a good laugh, so I did not offend her in any way, shape, or form. That was good. I told her I was the first Baptist pastor in Six Mile, so that way she could go to that church. No, I'm kidding. So... You know, families are all different. Some, of, some families are big, some are small. Some families, you know, you, you, you want to have kids and you're, you're desperate to have kids, but it hasn't happened, right? Like for whatever reason, you can't have them. So you're thinking of like IV or you're thinking of, you know, foster or adoption. 
Some of you are blended families. And when you got married, you brought adult children or younger children into the marriage with you. Maybe both of you did. And so your families are kind of blended. Others of you are single parents, single moms, single dads. Families all look different. Now, here's the thing. We put a, we put a pretty high value in our family. It's, 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 it's like our job. There's a high value in family too. Even for those of you who maybe you're in the room, you're watching, you're listening, and you say, well, I, 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 don't, I didn't have a good family life. It was broken. It was messed up. I, I don't really value that. Well, on the surface, you might say that. But actually, what I've observed over the years in my experience is that internally, you actually place a pretty high value right here because you want something you've never been able to have. Or if you're married, and if you have kids of your own, you're working so hard to give them a family life that you were never able to experience yourself. You actually place a pretty high value right here. Family is very important. We have a place for that too, and, we, and it has a, a very high, high value in our lives. But so is this one right here. This one also has a pretty high value, money, right? We all like money. Money, money, money. Yeah, pretty good. All of us like the money, the dollar bills. I, I, I'm a pastor. I got nothing great in here. It's, it's, it's just dollar, dollar bills in my wallet right now, buddy, okay? We all, we all have money, and, and money's important. There's a place for money, and we got to make sure we, we have a retirement account, a savings account. Maybe we have debt we're trying to get out of, and do we budget? How do we handle things? Uh, uh, premarital counseling, I always sit couples down, and, and, and you'll be, you would be shocked at how many couples in a premarital counseling situation have never talked about finances. Never. And I, the first thing I tell them is if you talked about money and if you talked about kids, those are the first two things I'll mention. And most of the time, it's one or the other. Typically, money's not the one they've talked about. And I tell them straight up, you better figure this out right now because more divorces and fights and conflicts happen over this right here than anything else. What do you do with money? And, and, and that's a big part of our lives and a big area of our lives, man. What do we do with that? And it, it, do, do we pay off debt? Do we give? Are we generous? What, what ha do we do a, a second job, a third job? You know, and, and, and here's the thing about money. It defines us as well. I'm rich. I'm poor. I'm, I'm middle class. I'm, I'm whatever. You're always trying to be defined by finance. Here's another one that's kind of similar to that. Time. Time's important. Man, we all, we all want to know how to manage time in our lives. Isn't it crazy? There's the same amount of time, minutes, hours, seconds, in every single week. And yet, how many of us will say, I don't have enough time? <laughs> A lot of us say that, don't we? I don't have enough time for this or that. You probably said that this week, didn't you? All right, I'm going to give you a hard truth that you may not want to hear, but you should hear it. The hard and cold reality of time is this. We all have the same amount of time. It's not that Jimmy has more time than you. The difference is you are not good at managing your time. And the reality is this. If you want to manage your time well, you have to learn to be more efficient. No one has more time than you do. They just manage it better. You got to figure out how you can manage time as well as you should, and you'll have more of it. That's a pretty important piece, okay? Time is important. And here's the thing about time. Once it goes, it ain't coming back. It's, it's a resource you can't replenish, so you got to manage it very well. All right, what about this one over here? We, 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 all, we all have some kind of hobby or some kind of activity we do that we enjoy. Now, I've got my sports club, my, my first baseman's mitt right here because I, I love, before I had kids, I loved adult softball. I played my adult softball league all over the place, man. I had, I had man, you should, a pastor had the baseball pants on. I looked like a ball player. You know, you don't believe that, but I did. It was pretty good. We all have hobbies, though. Maybe you like to garden or paint or, or hike. And you know what we'll do is, like, we'll work really Really hard over here at our job to make money, okay, so we can play right here with the hobbies. And, 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 and we like it because it relaxes us and we feel good and I can reset and refresh, which is all true. However, when you are so enthralled into the, the hobbies that you're spending too much time or too much money at the expense of time with family and spouses, this becomes an idol in your life. And this can cause a lot of issues for a lot of people. 
your hobbies can easily eclipse the things that are more important. And it's hard to manage everything. These buckets are adding up, aren't they? It's hard to manage all of that. But you've got to be careful that hobbies don't take away time from family, from spouses. They don't drain your bank account. But we also want to make sure our hobbies don't impact this bucket right here. It's our faith bucket. Yeah, that's right. Every Christian in the room, we got a faith bucket. A lot of you guys compartmentalize your faith. And not all of you do, but many of you do. Meaning how we compartmentalize our, our, our faith is like this. We say, okay, I go to church on Sunday. I go to group during the week. I got my praise music on in the car. I'm going to pray every morning, every night. We compartmentalize faith to where it fits nice and neat into our schedule and our day planner. But faith was never meant to be put in a day planner in a compartment somewhere. Hang with me. I want to talk more about that here in a little bit. Faith is not a bucket that you're supposed to confine your spiritual life to. It should be far more than that. So we have our faith bucket. We have our hobby bucket, our jobs. We got a few more down here too. We have, we have this one right here. That's a pretty important bucket. We have relationships. Relationship bucket. This is a pretty important bucket. This is a picture of my wife and I on the night that I graduated college. I've been dating for about a month. So we were, we were little, little in love students, man. College students, a relationship. Hey, we all have relationships. We, 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 we have this desire to do life together with other people. I, whether it's platonic, romantic, whatever it might be, there are, there's a desire for us to have relationship with people. And, and if for someone to say, you know, I hear this a lot as a pastor, well, you know, like, I don't have to be part of a church to follow Jesus and whatever. And I, here's, I used to say, well, oh, yeah, I guess that's true. And I've learned over the years, 100%, I disagree with that. I, I will disagree with that all day long, and I'll, I'll fight you over that one. You may not belong to a church like this, okay, fine. But you need somebody, whether it's two or three people that you hang out with every week to encourage you and help you grow in your faith. You were designed, and I was designed by God to do life together. When God creates Adam, just to go back to Genesis for a moment, God creates Adam. He looks at Adam, he's like, ah, you know, the guy's alone. He's talking to animals, right? Like he's talking to the giraffe and the hippo and it ain't working. He needs somebody. And so God creates a woman, Eve, who is, yes, there's a sexual attraction to that, but there is also relationship, companionship. There is, there is a connection. As human beings, we're not meant to be spiritual hermits. We are meant to be in connection and relationship with each other. And relationships are, are complex, and there's a lot, this is where like our sexual identity is found in this bucket too, and there's a lot of folks who are unsure about some things and confused about some stuff also in that bucket, and this is a, an interesting, complex, complicated bucket, and one that a lot of people try to manage on their own, and uh, they don't do a very good job of it. This last bucket has got nothing in it. It's empty. And so why is it empty? This bucket is the most important bucket. And there's a reason why I say that. This bucket is your secrets. This bucket is the bucket nobody knows anything about. The bucket that if you, know, if you could hide stuff from God, which you can't, God's what we call omniscient, meaning he knows everything. But if you could hide stuff from God and get away with it, you would. It's this bucket right here. I don't want anyone to know what I've done, who I did it with. I don't want anyone to know what I think. I, I don't even want God to know about some of that stuff. In fact, the only people who know things in that bucket are the people that either hurt us and harmed us or people that we did things with in, 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 in that moment in time. And it's a bucket that holds our hurts and our secrets, and our thoughts, and all the things we wish that other people would never find out and know about. And we, we do everything we can to protect this bucket right here. We'll destroy every other bucket on stage if we can keep this one safe and sound. We don't want anyone finding out what our secrets are, what our thoughts are, what's going on inside of us. That's where you get people who've carried around, for example, they've, they've got the same hurt. They've carried it for decades. 
because they're not letting anyone know about some things that have happened in their lives so long ago. Now you say for a second, hey, pastor, what's wrong with trying to manage and control all this stuff on stage? Like, but we compartmentalize for a reason. Why is that so wrong? Okay, it, the, the problem with this is when you try to manage your lives in all these buckets and you're trying to stay in control, you're not actually giving anything over to God. You see how this plays out? I can't give it over to God if I'm trying to control all the different buckets. And I got my hands everywhere. I'm looking at myself, how do I balance it? That's the one of the number one things I hear from a pastor from people. Pastor, my life was crazy. How do I balance everything? And I tell folks all the time, you can't. You cannot achieve balance. It is impossible. It's not. It's impossible. You can't do it. Life's about rhythms, not balance. But in asking the question to balance everything, you're asking the question, how do I control everything that I've got going on? And you can't do that. We'll talk about giving things over to God. We'll talk about managing things God's way, right? You know, we'll... This is, this is where Christians kind of come in, surface level stuff. We'll go to our job, you know, over here and pray for our boss and be the Jesus people don't ever see, you know, or whatever. We have a healthy family and try to manage our time well. We'll give because we're supposed to be generous. Pastor tells us to do that, so we do it. Hey, we got a hobby we like to do. Keeps everyone happy and fresh and reset and rested up. Faith, I go to church on Sunday. My family comes to church with me, you know. I've got... I've got my, my relationships together. You know, I, we'll, we'll sit there and say everything's okay and it's fine and it's all going well. On the surface, we'll say that, right? But the reality, again, is that underneath the surface, nothing's going well. We are stressed to the max because we're trying to figure out how do I balance wanting to do this, you know, hobby and thing I enjoy doing that I miss doing but I can't because now I got kids, right? And kids take up so much of my life and my time. And then I got, I've got, I got over here, I've got my faith bucket, which I, I know I got to go to church, but my gosh, we never get a break. Wouldn't it be great to take a couple of weekends off? And I, I can't take my, my time away from my work. Work's really important, but gosh, I hate my job. Like, you know, like we have all that. Kind of, like nothing's good under the surface because we're trying to control everything up here. But we'll tell people it's all, it's all good. God's got it. But we don't actually believe that, do we? It's not that organizing your life is bad per se. It's, it's not God's way, though. It's, it's not God's way. And if I want to follow Jesus, I want to do things God's way, right? That's my desire. When you compartmentalize, you try to control everything, and, 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 and you're viewing yourself not as the manager, you're viewing yourself as the owner. And we just learned from Psalm 24, 1, I'm not the owner, because God owns everything. He owns it all. The earth and all of its people belong to the Lord. So what if there's another bucket that doesn't look like any of these right here? What if there's another one that's different? It looks different, it acts different, it's just not the same. What if it's bigger? That's right, buddy. I got it. Look how strong your pastor is. Mm, got the, I got a whole pool. Go home and tell someone today, your pastor lifted a pool. You know what I'm saying? Don't tell them what kind of pool it was. Just tell them it was a pool. They'll be impressed. You got a big bucket. Well, there's another one right here that looks different, right? And it could swallow up everything else you've got. What if this bucket could take all the other ones that we have, man? And it could take everything else we've got and swallow it all up. Oh, there goes my water. This, and the pool. I know. I, I, hey, hey, I planned it like that, guys. Good thing it's water, not coffee. It could swallow everything up and here we go. We got, our, we got our bucket right there, okay? What if we had that? Instead of us trying to do it all, we decided we will stop trying to manage our lives. So what if you made that choice today? I'm going to stop trying to manage my life. I'm not going to do it anymore. See, that's what happens when you discover Christ. And you give everything over to Him and hand everything you have over to God. He's the one who begins to take care of everything. 
Colossians chapter three says this, since you've been raised to life in Jesus, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Look at this last line, this is very important. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. You died to this life. We aren't supposed to try to juggle everything. We're not supposed to try and control it all and manage it and have every little aspect work to our advantage. That's, you know, I'm going to say this morning, some of you in the room today, you are always tired and stressed and worn out and just kind of, ah, this ho-hum kind of thing. And the reason you are is because you are trying to manage and do all kinds of things in your life you weren't meant to do. You were meant to give those over to God. But you haven't, and because you're trying to make it all work, it's, it's eating away at you. And you're short with your spouse and your kids, and you feel borderline depressed, and you've got a high anxiety, and you're stressed to the max. You're trying to figure out, what am I doing wrong? You're living a life that God did not design for you. But Colossians says, set your mind and your life, and your identity, and your job, and who you are, everything you've got, set it all to Jesus. So what do you do? What if I told you the greatest act of management you could ever do would be to give yourselves over to Jesus and just let God manage you? My whole life. I'm not going to manage all this stuff. God take care of it. Let God do it. I'm all in for him. I want to let him take care of me. I want to let him manage me. I want him be the one that decides what's going to happen. If Christ had all of you, your job, your finances, your family, your pain, your brokenness, your victories, boy, and none of those other buckets right there, uh, they wouldn't define you. And the truth is, they should never define you. None of those buckets should ever define you in, in who you are. None of them. All the things you're trying to manage, all the things you're trying to work, all these little compartments that, and I, I had eight today, but there, there's, there's infinite amounts, right? I mean, every person's different. But all the compartments you're trying to manage, it's just, it's going to come back on you. It's not going to work out. You're supposed to die to those things. I'm convinced that many people have no idea about the Jesus we serve, in part because we spend so much of our time trying to make it look like we can manage everything and look like we're doing the right thing and look like we're healthy and look like we're a sovereign God and look all the... And that upkeep is a lot. That's a little too much if you ask me. As you try to control the different buckets, you find out, man, I'm not really serving God. Instead, I'm serving all these different areas of my life trying to make it work. I'm getting frustrated when it's not. So what does it look like when you give everything over to God? Well, it looks like this. You go to a job, and you're not worried about what's going to happen at that job if you make the right stand. I've got one of my younger brothers, I've got two younger brothers, and one of them, a couple years ago, he was in line for a, a, a big position at a, a major international company. I won't mention the company. Everyone in the room would know it if I said it. And he was in line. It was down between him and one other guy. We're talking weeks of interviews to get there. If you've interviewed for a job in the last five years, you know there's like a thousand. Like Dante has levels to hell. I think that's what HR has for these jobs, man. Like all these interviews you got to go. It's what it feels like. So, we're, so this long journey, he's at the very end. And it's him and one other guy and the final interview with this company. And they begin to tell him, hey, here's things you're going to have to do. Now, he hasn't had a job at this point in over a year. He's got kids. And, you know, for all the men in the room especially, boy, that eats away at you. You want to provide for your spouse, your family. You don't have a job that long. It's a bit, you're, it, you'll take anything to get it moving. And he, he told them in the interview, I cannot do the things you're asking me to do. Why? 
violates my principles and who I am. I cannot do it. He did not feel right about doing some of the things they were gonna ask him to do as a, just as a follower of Jesus. That's just what he, that's just what he felt. So they passed him over for the job and went to somebody else. And he might say, well, my gosh, can't he just manage his faith, right? Manage your faith, put it, put it in your little compartment and then pick up the work, the work thing here and, and go on. Like, that's what you're supposed to do. Well, he didn't live his life that way. For him, his life is, I'm all in for Jesus or I'm not. I can't do that. Now, a couple of weeks later, God opens another door. He gets a different job offer. He gets this job that paid more and was more flexible and better for his family than the one that he walked away from. There's something about faithfulness that God rewards, isn't there? And recognizing that it's not about trying to control all the different, it's about going all in for Jesus and letting him take care of the rest. It's really important. That's what that looks like. I'm going all in for God. When I give my life over to him completely, I stop trying to control all the different parts of my life. And you begin to live in such a way which honors the message of Christ. The message, of, that's what the gospel is. The gospel is the message of Jesus. You begin to live that out in your life. Philippians 1.27 says this, above all, you must live as what? As citizens of America, right? Be a good American, do the patriotic thing, God will reward you. No. Citizens of South Carolina, because the best state in the union, which might be true no matter what. No, not that either. Citizens of heaven. I don't want to go down a rabbit trail. I got to be careful. I think it's important to vote. I mentioned that earlier. Also important to remember, you don't belong here as a follower of Jesus. Well, if this person was the White House, it's all over. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, no. Because as a follower of Jesus, I know who sits on the throne, and I ain't ever going to change. I don't belong here, I belong there. And while things might get more difficult here, for sure, I ain't worried about it. Because in the end, I know where my salvation and faith is secure at. I know who's in control. I know who's got it. You know why? Because I'm not living in a compartmentalized way. I'm living all in for Jesus. That's what that looks like. It looks like that. Above all, Paul says, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Man, whether you've lost a job or got a new job, whether you hate your boss or love your boss, okay, uh, whether you belong to, to a, 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 a neighborhood that you like or not, whatever, I don't know what your situation is. Here's, here's what I do know. No matter what, all right, when you are all in for Jesus and, and you are living for him, living the gospel out, man, it, it changes you for the better. You're not letting things get to you anymore. You know, you don't look at all these compartments and buckets as if they're yours. They all belong to Christ. They all belong to God. And you're giving him your whole life. And it's not your job to manage it. It's his job to do with it however he wants to. He has complete control. The hardest bucket, and I said it was the most important earlier, but the hardest bucket is that bucket on secrets. It's the hardest one to give over to God. That's the one we always want to keep. I said earlier this morning that that's the one bucket that, man, we will destroy everything else to keep that bucket safe. We don't want anyone getting that bucket. That bucket we guard with our very lives. It's the hardest one to give over to God. And again, I think the reason why we struggle so much is it comes down to control. All this living for each bucket, man, even for that last one, those secrets, buddy, it can prevent you from really drawing close to Jesus and letting him take control of you. And if you would just give everything over to God, dude, it will be a game changer for you. Your life will change. It'll never be the same. You'll begin to live in a way which honors him and Instead of fulfilling your own pleasures, you find joy in being used by God for his pleasure and his kingdom and his purpose. Matthew 6, 31 through 33, Jesus talks about the human desire to control all these buckets. Listen to what he says right here. He says this. Don't worry about all these things. What things? 
my job, my time, my finances, my hobbies, my family. Don't worry about all those things. Those buckets, don't worry about that, okay? What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? These things dominate the thoughts of who? Of people who don't know God, unbelievers, people who don't know the Lord. They dominate their thoughts because they don't know. They don't know that God can control. They don't, they don't know that stuff yet. But your heavenly Father, He knows your needs. Look at that. He already knows your needs. You know that before I pray and ask God for something, He already knows about it. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. If you're someone who's new in your walk and your faith, you should underline, highlight, circle, whatever this verse right here is. It's, this is very important. Seek the kingdom of God above all and live righteously, and He will give everything that you need. Not a little bit, not a few things, everything. Not everything is not what you want, okay? I want a brand new Tesla. It ain't happening in all likelihood. Not God. I can't say it won't. Maybe it will, but probably not. No, everything you need. I need food. I need clothing. I need shelter. God will meet that need. I, I need a job. God will meet that need. I, I need healing. And my, God, can, God can meet the needs, and he will meet the needs, if what? If you seek God first. Not the compartments and the buckets. I seek God first. God is not impressed with your ability to control all the buckets, man. None of them belong to you. They belong to him. In fact, when, when he writes Philippians, Paul says, look at Philippians 1.21. Paul says, for me, living, right, means living for Christ. You're not called to live for the buckets and control and manage these parts of your life. You're called to surrender over to Jesus and let him manage you. It doesn't mean that you should do more. More, more at your job, more in your finances, more even in your, like your faith life. Oh, if I just pray more and go to church more, do things. No, no, stop with the more stuff and just surrender everything over to God. That's the thing you got. Don't do more. Surrender and let go and let God have it all. Let him transform you by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And your life and everything you have, man, it's no longer yours when that happens. It becomes his and you go all in. Paul continues in Philippians. He, he writes about, in Philippians 4.12, how he's found the, the secret to contentment. Philippians 4.12, no one knows much about. They all focus on the next verse. The next verse, they, they take out of context and misuse, and it drives me crazy as a pastor. The next verse is not possible without chapter, verse number 12. In verse number 12, Paul talks about finding the secret of contentment which led him to pen Philippians 4.13, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. This is not, you know, we beat Texas A&M, Gamecocks. We can do it all through Jesus. Isn't that great? That's not what that's about. Paul writes, and it's about, I found contentment in Jesus. I don't have to manage all my buckets because I am content in who Christ is. And because of that, I'll do anything. What does that mean? Well, for Paul, he went without food and clothing and shelter. But he was content because he knew God will take care of me, provide, provide for me, and I'll be okay. And he could do anything because of that. It, it meant that he was imprisoned and beaten and left for dead. But he, he got back up and God gave him strength and he could do anything through Christ because he was content. Whatever position I find myself in, whether I'm laying on the floor of a dungeon or I'm left for dead outside of a village or I'm shipwrecked, I'm good because God's got me and I, I'll be able to do whatever it is that God's asking me to do. No matter what happens with these buckets right here, when I go all in for Jesus, I am content with with what God's given me. Maybe you'll never have the life you wanted and the assets and the house and all the things you desire. That's okay. That's fine. If you have Jesus, you have all that you need. Be content with what God has given you. I'm a Gamecock. I, I, you guys know that. For you guys who are new, I know it's a shocker. We're 10 minutes from Clemson. How do I wind up here? Uh, they, they got my money. I'm, I'm an alum. So when you start paying tuition, you'll be a Gamecock forever. I don't care how they perform in the football field. I paid too much money. I'm all in, man. But you know, whether you're a Clemson Tiger or a Gamecock, you know, this time of year, we don't miss nothing. 
you guys were watching the game last night. You watched what happened with Louisville. You didn't miss that thing. You were watching it. it you're checking your phone. If you're not at the game, buddy, you checking that phone, making sure, all right, Mafa scored another touchdown. We're good, you know? Like, you're doing that kind of, hey, you, 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 you will even manage your life. You, you might find this to be crazy, but there are people I know I went to school with if they got married in the fall, they, they, they got married on a bye week. They were not going to interfere with football. We, 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 that's just how we are. Right? And it, like, we're all in. We check in the scores. Man, we manage all kinds of stuff around that. But what would happen if we manage our spiritual lives the same way? Yeah, I could be gone this weekend. I'm not trying to guilt trip you for missing a weekend at church. I would never do that. But I'm just saying, you know, I could be gone this weekend or I could be with my church family. I'm going to, it's not going to hurt what I'm doing. I'm going to reorganize how I do things this week. I, I just, what if we just reorganized our lives to be all in for Jesus and just didn't worry about managing around all these other things we have trying to, we're trying to control these buckets. If we had the same tenacity and passion that we have for our favorite sports teams or whatever, right? What would happen if we stopped trying to be good little Christians, doing all the things we're supposed to do that everyone expects us to do, and stopped trying to manage all these buckets and we just gave ourselves all in for Jesus and stopped worrying about trying to control everything and just let God control our lives and lead us? I, I can't get away from this story, man. It, it's, it's, I shared it a few weeks ago. I can't get rid of it. I think it's the Holy Spirit. There's a man in the, in the Gospels. He comes to Jesus and he's like, man, I want to follow you. I think so many of us want to follow Christ. You might be in the room today. You might, man, I'm, I'm all in for Christ. You would tell me that. You'd say, Pastor, I'm a follower, you know? And you're all in for the most part. This guy, he wants to follow Jesus. And Jesus says, well, okay, great. Have you kept all the commands? He had not fulfilled the law and the prophets just yet. He hadn't died and risen again yet. So he's like, hey, have you, have you, have you kept the law? Did you, follow, did you follow the commands? And he's like, man, 100%. I did all of that. I got it. I'm all in. And Jesus says, man, that's fantastic. One thing I want you to do, and you can follow me. Take everything you've got, sell it, and then come after me. And the scripture says he walked away downcast. He was saddened because he had great wealth. Now, we misread that and we think, well, you know, wealthy people can't follow Jesus. So that's garbage. Of course they can. It's not, nothing to do about wealth. That misses the point. He was 99% of the way in. What was the one thing holding him back? Couldn't let go of his wealth. And maybe you're here this morning where you're watching or listening online. You say, man, I, I, I'm all in for God. I'm all in. Okay. What is that one thing holding you back? What's that one bucket you can't let go of? Maybe it is finances. Okay. Maybe, maybe it's time. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's your job. I don't know what it is. But I really believe there's at least one or two of you, man. You're struggling to let go of whatever it is that one thing might be. That one thing, I will tell you right now, that one thing will keep you from living the life that God has for you. You have got to let it go and let God have it. Let the Lord control it. One more story and I'm done. It's a man in the Old Testament lost everything, all of his buckets, lost them all. Family, finances, everything. His name is Job. Everything's taken away from him. Found out that, man, I, I've got nothing left. But Job did not manage his life and try to control things on his own. But Job did instead, it was Job decided, you know, I'm going to go all in and I'm going to let God have everything. 
Everyone can figure it out. Job, what have you done wrong? You, you screwed up, dude. What, what sin did you commit, man? Nothing. I'm just going to praise God. I'm just going to give God thanks. Your family is decimated. Your wealth is gone. I know. I'm going to praise God. You're suffering from all these, this disease and these sores. I mean, you can't be feeling good. I know, man. I'm going to praise God. Why? Uh, he was all in for the Lord. He was all in. He let God manage his life for him. He let God figure out. He's, he's the owner, man. God's going to have it all. You know what the Lord did to Job? Because Job stayed faithful and didn't try to manage everything and he was all in for God, at the end of the story, God gave Job everything that was taken from him back. And then some. There was blessing for Job because he had gone all in for the Lord. And that's the real question today. The real question is, are you all in? Not 85%, 99%. Are you all in? in for God. Are you there, man? Does he have it all? If you try to control even one area of your life, buddy, you're going to wind up tired and frustrated and depressed and anxious and stressed out and not at peace. It's never going to work. When I say that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life, it means I have surrendered everything and who I am over to him. Now, do I do this perfectly all the time? No, there are times where I really mess this thing up. But I've given everything over to God as best I can. I've surrendered everything over to him. And my big ask today is, are you willing to do the same? Bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. I know I went a little long today. Thanks for hanging with me. Maybe you're here this morning. You said, Pastor, I've listened to what you got to say, and I am not all in for Jesus like I should be. I got some things that I'm holding on to. I've got one thing in my life I can't let go of. I'm trying to manage and control all kinds of things, and man, you, you're right. Like, I feel tired. I feel worn down. And I don't, I'm tired. Like, how does it stop? It stops like this. I give it over to God. It starts when I say, Jesus, you can have it all. My life and who I am, I give it to you. I want to lead you in a prayer that will be the first spiritual step you need to take to following the Lord. I, I'm going to say it out loud. You don't have to pray it out loud or, or even pray it verbatim. I'm just going to model for you how it should go. I want you to say it in your own words, but it should, I'm going to model it for you. And if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I need to make Jesus Lord of my life. I'm ready to go all in for Christ. I want you to pray along with me. And we'll pray for those of you who are believers in just a minute. But for those of you who haven't said yes to Christ, this is the most important choice you'll make. To stop trying to control things and go all in for, for the Lord. So it goes like this. And Jesus, I'm sorry for the sin that I've committed. Will you please forgive me for the wrongs that I've done? I, I know that I've done things that they violate your standards, man. They're not up to par. I got that. I, I'm here today not to say I, I, I've got it all right. I'm here today to say I need a Savior in my life. Will you forgive me? Will you forgive me of my sin? Will you save me from the wrongs that I've done? I don't want to live for myself anymore. I'm, I'm ready to live for you. I'm ready to go all in. Will you be the Savior of my life today? And from this day forward, I'm not going to try to control any more buckets. I'm just going to go all in for you. From this day forward, I want to make sure I'm following and serving you. Will you be the Lord of my life? You guide me and direct me and you call the shots from this day on. I'm not going to do it. You take me where I need to go. You take ownership of my life and all that I have. I don't want to try to manage it anymore. I want you to have all of it. It's, it's all going to go to you. Be my Savior and my Lord today. Now, God, for those who are believers in the house and they're struggling with some things, maybe it's the one thing they can't let go of. Maybe they've been trying to find balance 
and they've tried to manage all kinds of stuff in their life instead of giving it over to you. I pray this morning, Lord, you would show them what real peace can look like. When we go all in for you and we give it all over to you, God, our job, our family, our finances, our time, everything, boy, we can find real peace in your hands. We can find real meaning and purpose. I, I pray we're not defined by what we do, but we're defined by whom we serve. Lord, I pray for those believers this morning who might be struggling, that they, unlike that, that young man who walked away, they come running to you. God, you can have it. You can take it. It's not mine, it's yours. My life that belongs to me belongs to you. My marriage belongs to you. My job belongs to you. My finances belong to you. All the stress I have, all the anxiety of trying to make this all work, I'm done with that. I'm going all in for you. God, you take it. Take it all. You're the owner. You take it. Lord, I pray you set some folks free today who've been trying so hard for so long to make it all work. Set them free and let them know, God, you are the owner. The world and all of its people belong to you. May we all be all in for you, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.